as a supplement to our reading of the Communist Manifesto of Marx and Engels, I thought I would uh, talk about the economic manuscripts of 1844, economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844, uh, when Marx was quite a young man. And uh, this text was not published until the 20th century. Okay, so not didn't appear during his lifetime. Uh, I mean, th th it's a very rich uh, text, and uh, it's not entirely clear um, how in how completely compatible it is with some of the later ideas of Marx, maybe uh, somewhat more radical ideas of Marx in some ways. Um, but at any rate, it's pretty fundamental set of ideas. The passages we have from the, that manuscript um, uh, focus on the concept of alienation, which is certainly central to Marx and Marxism. Uh, I think it's, I guess one way to just frame this is that it's the critique of capitalism. The notion of alienation, which just means separation, estrangement, uh, is in capsule what is intolerable about capitalism, I guess, is the idea. Or it's a way of capturing the contradiction. We talked about the dialectical process of history. Um, uh, it's a way of capturing the contradictions at the heart of capitalism, which supposedly will drive it to uh, extinction or drive a revolution that overthrows it. All right, so this concept of alienation or separation, which has been so influential in so many ways, and I guess so many people have found it somehow corresponds or captures something important about their own experience in capitalism or whatever phase we might be at, um, has a number of dimensions, all of which are at least mentioned in this manuscript, or a number of, it, it describes a number of different, uh, it describes a relation among a number of different kinds of relata, things to be related to one another. So, um, let's look at this. Capitalism creates alienation, that is estrangement, detachment, separation between, I really should like figure out how to do this in a decent way, right? <laughs> Uh, between a worker and the product of his or her labor, which is actually owned by someone else. Like compare a, uh, like a crafter and their relation to what they produce uh, to an industrial worker and what uh, he produces. Uh, the product of the labor of the industrial worker is owned by the owner of the factory. Uh, not by himself. Uh, and in fact, the, since the classes of the owners and the uh, workers are in conflict, uh, according to Marx, you know, fundamental conflict, the, lab the um, product of the labor, product of the laborers, the product of the worker's labor is dedicated to a force that is hostile to the worker. It increases the power of the class that oppresses the worker. So your own labor is turned against yourself in capitalism, uh, in Marx's view. Again, we're dealing with like the high tide of industrial capitalism. Um, okay, and also an estrangement or a, between a person and their labor itself, which is the product of her own body, right? Which is now owned, which is commodified. Like, uh, you sell it to the highest bidder, really, uh, your own labor, all right? So you're, the work of your own body is taken from you in a certain way and uh, used to increase the powers hostile to you. Um, and, uh, capitalism induces a, and this is really an interesting theme to explore, um, so allegedly uh, introduces an estrangement between each person and nature, physical reality, right? 
Uh, in fact, you know, the way we use things, our relations to things, um, is, you know, altered by the fact that these things are produced in industrial capitalism in this exploitative way, right? You, and, you know, you could think about this more profoundly than Marx really does here, and maybe he did here and there. Uh, it's an estrangement from the whole of the physical universe, uh, which again, like takes on the form of a hostile force to the industrial worker or the impoverished person under capitalism. Um, there's a social estrangement between the worker and all other people. Uh, maybe this begins by the fact that uh, in capitalism, each laborer is conceived of as competing with each other laborer. Right, so if you do well, I do less well. Right, like we're not, it's, solidarity is gonna be very difficult to achieve at that point. Uh, and definitely solidarity across classes is not one of the possibilities unless you're an enthusiast for oppression. Um, so there's social estrangement. I mean, Marx thinks that um, in fact, all our, my relations to myself, my self-image and stuff like this is created in social relations. And the social relations that introduce, that, that are, that are uh, characteristic of capitalism, turn each person into this kind of atom pursuing their own self-interest. That's the way, you know, uh, allegedly, this is not quite fair, that Adam Smith conceives a free market for example, each per or Hobbes uh, conceives political philosophy, starting with each person pursuing their own self-interest. That for Marx is capitalist ideology, okay? But it's also a destruction of social cohesion, an alienation of each person from each other person. If you're getting the impression that capitalism is an utter disaster for Marx, like just, uh, and for all these Marxists that followed, just the devil incarnate. Uh, you're um, you're not far wrong. Um, okay, uh, and uh, then also between and I mean we've already seen signs of this. Each person and herself. So again, each person's social relations uh, actually govern their self-image for Marx. This is all could be quite complicated. Uh, that that much is pretty plausible. He's getting some of this from Hegel. And uh, each person loses themselves ultimately in, uh, through all these various separations, right? Um, and, uh, you know, that's kind of often described as the alienated condition of modernity, the existential crisis of each person in modernity where we all hate being alive or we're so outside our own bodies or environments. I don't read it all of, all of everything quite that way, but uh, whatever, it's an interesting critique, obviously, and with some bite, obviously, and it had an unbelievably, you know, century and a half of uh, extreme play, which it still is. So let's look at some of the passages real quick from the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts. Selection start on page 701 of Stephen Kahn's Political Philosophy, The Essential Text. This is 702. The worker becomes all the poorer and more, the more wealth he produces, the more his production increases in power and size. So the more productive a worker is, the more successful the capitalist is. Um, so the better worker I am, the stronger the forces arrayed against me, right? the stronger the forces that oppress me. The worker becomes an ever cheaper commodity, the more commodities he creates. And that's really the way that capitalism falls, according to Marx, busting wages down to subsistence as you also try to maximize the productivity of each worker. 
that's a contradiction at the heart of capitalism that would have destroyed it, actually, if it hadn't been ameliorated, I think. Um, but it's easy to see why someone would think that that was the logic of capitalism. I mean, it is the logic of capitalism uh, in a certain way. Um, but in 1850, let's say, you know, um, it look, it, you know, capitalism has been transformed many times since then. Um, and it's interesting to think to what extent these conditions obtain at any given moment in that history. With the increasing value of the world of things proceeds in direct proportion, the devaluation of the world of men, the commodity becomes more important than the human. Very characteristic uh, Marxist thought, early, especially early. Labor produces not only commodities, it produces itself and the worker as a commodity. And this is in the same general proportion in which it produces commodities. Maybe it's even talking about the way workers reproduce, you know, make more workers. Um, the fact, this fact expresses itself, like even having children, uh, Producing children would be a way of increasing the powers that oppress you in the sense that they're going to be fed into this capitalist uh, wage labor system. The fact expresses merely that the ob this fact expresses merely that the object which labor produces, labor's product, confronts it as something alien, as a power independent of the producer. The product of labor is labor which has been embodied in an object. It is the objectification of labor. A commodity is, the, is objectified labor, labor made into a material thing. Labor's realization is its objectification. In the sphere of political economy, this realization of labor appears as a loss of realization for the workers. Objectification as loss of the object and bondage to it, slavery to objects, to commodities, both as consumers uh, and, and as producers. Appropriation as estrangement, as alienation. Right. That's the basic, maybe the most basic statement of the definition of alienation in, in Marx, uh, Marxist theory. Um, all these consequences result from the fact that the worker is related to the product of his labor as to an alien object. And for Marx, what's most characteristic of human beings is that we make things. Okay, we produce things, and he explores that, he asserts that in this text. Uh, so if your producing capacity is being appropriated from you by others, uh, your humanity, what's most characteristic of us as a species, is being taken from you. It's not good, right? Uh, it's, it's a little abstract, you know, um, a little symbolical to really engage uh, particular lives. But like I say, people certainly found their lives in it though. Um, on this premise, it's clear that the more the worker spends himself, the more powerful becomes the alien world of objects which he creates over and against himself. Like the, and this is the alienation of the worker from the physical surround, the environment. Um, the poor he himself, his inner world, his inner world becomes. Poverty is external, a matter of resources, but it's also internal. The alienation has this kind of existential crisis quality where you lose yourself in a way that is happening up here, among other things. Um, okay. Uh, it is the same in religion. And this is actually a kind of thought that was going around in Marx's circle, the young Hegelians in the 1840s. Um, the more man puts into God, the less he retains in himself. And, you know, Marx was definitely an atheist. So this idea that religion is alienating, and this was an idea that uh, Marx gets from people like Bruno Bauer, um, that we externalize what's proper to the humanity, pretend it's an objective fact out there in the universe, lose it in ourselves and attribute it to something else outside ourselves. All right. Um, okay. 
The alienation of the worker in his product means not only that his labor becomes an object, an external existence, but that it exists outside him independently as something alien to him, and that it becomes a power on its own confronting him. It means that the life which he has conferred on the object, and that's what we do as human beings, we confer our lives on objects, we make things with our labor, we're called lock. We mix our labor with things and appropriate pieces of the environment um, and transform them in an act of production. Um, it means that the life which he has conferred on the object confronts him as something hostile, an alien. Um, okay, uh, and I mean, the stuff about alienation from nature is really very interesting. And in the light of the rise of the environmental movement in the late 20th century and uh, climate change activism and so on, uh, you know, the role of capitalism in environmental problems is, uh, um, it, th this is a, perhaps a rich philosophical way into that. Although I'll say like, the, you know, it's not that communist regimes, for example, were so environmentally friendly. But anyway, that's not, Marx wasn't running those regimes. Um, the universality, this is on page 704, the bottom of the left-hand column. The universality of man appears in practice precisely in the universality which makes all, all nature his inorganic body. This is really pretty interesting. Uh, both inasmuch as nature is one, his direct means of life, and two, the material, the object, and the instrument of his life activity. And we're totally inside it. It is our life, nature. Nature is man's inorganic body. Nature, that is, insofar as it is not itself the human body. Man lives on nature, means that nature is his body, with which he must remain in continuous interchange if he is not to die. That man's physical and spiritual life is linked to nature, means simply that nature is linked to itself, for man is part of nature. And yet in capitalism, we get separated from nature as an object to be transformed, appropriated for the sake of someone else, right? uh, and lose our connection to nature or whatever. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and then, you know, I mean, one thing that was really influential with Marx and that you see premonitions of in Hegel and many other places actually, is the idea of the centrality of the social to human life that, and to the human individual self, the idea of the primacy of the social, or the idea that the human individual self is a product of the social rather than vice versa. And Marx has many interesting uh, moments of asserting that and uh, elaborating that thought, which has been so central to uh, many kinds of thought ever since, including psychology and sociology and so on. Um, so, I mean, this is a typical thing of where he asserts that. This is on 705 in the right-hand column, um, near the top, the third paragraph. The estrangement of man, and in fact every relationship in which man stands to himself, every relationship I as an individual have to myself, every way I regard myself, every way I present myself, uh, is first realized and expressed in the relationship in which a man stands to other men. Supremacy of the individual over the, I mean, of the social over the individual, I guess. It's interesting because right at the same time, uh, there's a lot of extreme individualism in philosophy and uh, literature and so on. Uh, you might think of uh, Thoreau, who we didn't read, very much a contemporary uh, of these texts, uh, and Emerson, or Kierkegaard. These are the most extreme individuals who ever lived. So there are... Uh, I don't know, there's a dialectic in 1840 and 1850 between the most extreme individualists who think that the social is completely uh, a reflection of the individuals who inhabit it and uh, socialists and communists uh, of this kind, for example, who think of every aspect of every individual life 
like Thoreau alone in his cabin or whatever, as a reflection of the social. Think of human beings primarily as social creatures. An idea that maybe goes back to Aristotle or further than that, even. As we saw. Um, okay. Um, it's a strange labor that creates private property. And uh, it's private property that leads to uh, ever greater inner inequality and finally to revolution. Um, so he says, for example, this is on 706 in the bottom of the left-hand column. Thus, though a strange labor, through a strange labor, uh, man not only creates his relationship to the object and the act of production as to men that are alien and hostile to him, his fellow workers, among others, he also creates a relationship in which other men stand to his production and to his product and the relationship in which he stands to those other men, just as he creates his own production as the loss of his reality as his punishment, his own product as a loss, as a product not belonging to him, so he creates the domination of the person who does not produce over production and over the product. So the laborer, the producer, creates by his production um, the person who does not produce, that is the capitalist owner, the parasite. Uh, just as he estranges his own activity from himself, so he confers to the stranger an activity that is not his own. Private property is thus the product, the result, the necessary consequence of alienated labor, of the external relation of the work to nature and himself. All right. Um, that's some deep stuff. There's plenty more to talk about. Uh, with regard to Marx, of course. Uh, but now we're going to be get on to Virginia Held and uh, her interesting critique of contractarian political philosophy. I'll hit you with a lecture on that in the next few days. Hope everything's good. Everything's good here in New York Springs, although it's a rainy day. Peace.